Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. So in today's video, we are going to be solving the sample paper. So I'm going to do it part by part. So in this video, I will take up a few problems and the rest of the problems, I'll bring it in the next video. So let's start with the first problem. So, so this is the first problem in the paper. So the question statement says that consider a horizontal frictionless XY plane as shown in the figure. It is divided into two regions, one and two by a line AB satisfying the equation X equals X1. So, so this is the line that separates the two regions. So the potential energy of a point particle of mass M in region one is V equals zero while the potential while it is V equal to V naught in the region two. The particle is sent from the origin with the speed of V1 along a line a line making an angle of theta one with the x axis so the particle is projected like this and this angle is given to be theta one it reaches point p in region two traveling with the speed of v2 along a line that makes an angle of theta two with the x axis so we have to ignore gravity and relativistic effects which of the following statements are true so the first thing we need to understand is uh, if we look at region one the potential everywhere is zero and region one corresponds to region x less than x1 right so if i want to figure out the force that is acting on the particle then this is actually minus dou v by dou x in the i cap direction minus dou v by dou y in the j cap direction okay now as it's given that the potential is constant what that means is the force acting on the particle is zero so the net force that is acting on the particle is zero so what that means is the particle will travel along a straight line and after entering the region 2, it's given that the particle travels along a line that makes an angle of theta 2 with the horizontal. So we can uh, easily figure out a relation between V1 and V2 using energy conservation. So and that is what is asked in option A. So the kinetic energy of the particle in region 1 is half m V1 squared. And we know the potential everywhere is 0 in region 1, so it's 0. And this is equal to the potential in region 2, which is V0 plus the kinetic energy half m v2 squared. So from here we get option A that is v1 square minus v2 square equals 2 v0 by m. So now let's try to plot the graph of uh, the potential versus. So the graph is pretty straightforward from x equals to 0 till x equals x1 everywhere the potential is 0 and then it suddenly jumps to a value of v0. So for x less than x1 it's 0 and for x greater than x1 it's v0. Now negative of the slope of potential versus x curve gives us the force in the x direction right. So from 0 to x1 the force is 0 and from x1 till infinity the force is 0. But uh, at x equal to x1 you can actually see that the slope is actually infinity like the um, the change in v with a small x is extremely high. So if I want to plot the fx curve till x equals x1 it'll have a value of 0 then it quickly shoots up and then it comes back to 0. So this is how the force versus x curve is looking like. So and this is what we call as an impulsive force right. So now in both the options they're saying that there is an impulsive force in the y direction. So one of the options must have been in the x direction. So uh, which is obviously true right. So at x equals to x1 which is basically at the boundary there is an impulsive force in the x direction. So option b is actually correct. Okay, so now we have to comment on this particular relation between V1 and theta. Okay, so once again, the particle was traveling with a velocity of V1 and it will keep traveling till it hits the boundary. And after hitting the boundary, an impulsive force acts on it along the X direction and its final velocity vector becomes V2. So now let's try to draw an impulse diagram. So the initial velocity of the particle was V1 and it was making an angle of theta1 with the horizontal. And the impulse was again along the X direction. So there is one more thing that we had to discuss. We can, from the energy equation, we can see that speed of the particle is decreasing. So V2 is clearly less than V1. So what that means is the impulse would actually act in the minus X direction. Term the impulse as J. So this should be MV1 because it's a momentum vector. So what the impulse momentum theorem states is that to the initial momentum vector, if we add, add impulse vector, we should get the final momentum vector. So the final momentum vector will become something like this. So the magnitude is V2 and it makes an angle of theta2 with the... So now as we clearly know that the impulse is in the horizontal direction, the Y direction momentum will not change. So what that means is MV1 sine theta1 equals M v2 sine theta 2 and from here v1 sine theta 1 equals v2 sine theta 2 is option d so so if assuming this option was the impulsive force in the, is in the minus x direction the answer to this question will be a b and d so now let's move to the next question so this problem is based on dimensions so it's given that mass and torque are dimensionless so 
if length has a dimension of L, then we have to figure out the dimensions of these quantities. Again, the dimension of mass is given to be nothing. So, so the dimension of mass will be some constant and the dimension of torque is also some other constant. Torque, I can also write it as the force multiplied by distance. I can write it this way and the distance, uh, the dimension of the length is given to be L. This I'm gonna write it as L and this is also going to be a constant K dash. So the dimension of force is going to be length inverse. Now force, I can also write it as mass times the acceleration. And here again, mass is given to be dimensionless. So we'll take it off. So the dimension of time to the power minus two is going to be L to the power minus two. So the dimension of time turns out to be the same as the dimension of length. Okay, so now uh, if you look at option D, they're asking us about the dimension of pressure. So pressure, so dimension of pressure is the dimension of force divided by the dimension of area. And dimension of force is L to the power minus one. And if I divide it with dimension of area, which is L square, I get L to the power minus three. So option D is actually correct. So now, and similarly, the dimension of surface tension will be F by L which is L power minus two. So option C is actually wrong. Now uh, in option B, they're saying the dimension of angular momentum. Now we know we can write torque as dl by dt. So the dimension of angular momentum is the same as the dimension of torque times the dimension of time. And torque is given to be dimensionless. Uh, and the dimension of time we determined as dimension of length. So the dimension of angular momentum comes out to be L. So option B is actually wrong. Uh, now angular momentum is just r cross p so the dimension of linear momentum is angular momentum's dimension divided by length so momentum actually turns out to be dimensionless so option a is also wrong so the answer to this question if i have not made any mistake is d okay so now let's move on to the next question okay guys so moving on to problem number three so in the question we have a positive point charge q that is located inside a neutral hollow spherical conducting shell so key point, it is a conducting shell. The shell has an inner radius of A and outer radius of B. And it's given that B minus A is not negligible. So it's not, a, so it's not really a thin shell. So the shell is centered at the origin and the point charge Q is located at the origin in the center of the shell. So then we have to comment on these options. Okay, guys. so now it's given that the positive point charge plus Q is kept at the origin. So there will be induced charges uh, accumulating in the inner surface of the shell. If you sum up all of these charges, induced charges, in terms of magnitude, it should add up to plus Q, right? If you take a Gaussian surface inside the conducting shell, we know that the net electric flux through this Gaussian surface must be zero, uh, which just means that the induced charges should be equal to minus Q. Only in that situation will the net charge enclosed in this Gaussian surface would be zero. And now by charge conservation, uh, as we have negative charges induced on the inner surface of the shell, there will be positive charges on the outer surface. If the plus Q charge is pl placed at the center, the sigma at the, in the inner surface will be uniform and also the sigma at the outer surface will be uniform. So now let's try to determine the electric field everywhere. So if I take any Gaussian surface within the inner shell, I can see that the net charge enclosed is Q. Uh, so if I apply Gauss's law, I'll just get electric field as uh, KQ by R square. So this is for R less than a. And for R lying between A and B, uh, so basically we're talking about the meat of the conductor, right, within the conducting shell. There we know that the electric field is actually zero, right? So this is a property of the conductor. So from R equals A to B, the electric field is zero. And for R greater than B, again, the net charge enclosed will simply be Q. So the electric field is going to be KQ by R squared. So this is how the electric field is varying with R. Now in the first question, they want us to find out the electric potential at X equals to A, uh, which means the electric potential at the inner shell. Okay, so there are two ways to figure it out. So one way is like we start at infinity and we'll just do a line integral. We'll connect this radial line from infinity to the inner shell. Okay, and we'll just perform integral e dot dl. e dot dl from infinity to the, to the inner shell, which is at r equals a, right? If we perform the negative of this integral, uh, we'll get the potential at a minus potential at infinity, v, which we just take it to be zero. So we have to compute this integral now, basically. So the electric field everywhere is pretty simple. It is just KQ by R square. So, so now as we go from the in, from infinity to the outer shell, everywhere the electric field is KQ by R square. So if I go from infinity to B, the electric field everywhere is KQ by R squared. From B to A, we're inside the conductor. So everywhere the electric field is zero. So this this would just become zero dot here. So this is just zero. Um, now, if you perform this integral, uh, the answer will just come out to be KQ by B. And this would be the potential uh, at the inner shell and uh, so and therefore option A is actually correct okay uh, another way to solve this would be to consider these three charges as independent bodies so we want the potential at this particular point let's call it point A which is on the inner shell right so now the distance of plus Q charge from the inner shell is is going to be A so the potential due to plus Q will be KQ by A 
Now this shell, you can just consider it as a uniformly charged shell uh, whose charge on the surface is minus Q. Now we know that the, the potential on the surface due to a uniformly charged shell is simply KQ divided by its radius. So due to the shell, it is going to be minus KQ by A. Last guy is obviously this outer shell, which is positively charged. And obviously this point is that it actually lies inside, inside the shell, right? So, and we know that for a uniformly charged shell, everywhere inside the potential is same as the potential on the surface. And that would simply be KQ by B. Therefore the potential at the inner surface would simply become KQ by B. So you can solve it in this way as well, okay? Now in option B, they're saying the magnitude of electric field at x equals A is kq by B square. That is actually not true. Uh, at, a, at x equal to A, in fact, the electric field is discontinuous. So just to the left of A, the electric field is kq by A square. And just to the right of A, we enter the conductor. So there the electric field is zero. So option B will actually be wrong. Then option C, they're saying the magnitude of electric field from x equals A to x equals b is not equal. Now guys, I think this option is a bit ambiguous because if you try to draw the plot of e versus x, so close to the center, uh, the electric field is, has an extremely large magnitude, and then it varies as one by r square. And when we reach x equals a, the electric field, uh, there's a discontinuity, and the electric field quickly becomes zero. And from x equals to a till x equals b, the electric field is zero. And after that, it becomes kq by b square, and again, varies as 1 by r square. So this is how the plot of the electric field versus x looks like. So now the thing is this, they actually mentioned the point x equals to a till x equals to b. At x equals to a, the electric field is not really defined because just to the left of a, it has a different value and just to the right of a, it has a different value. Now, if we exclude x equals to a and x equals to b and we talk about this interval, then yes, everywhere the electric field is zero, which means everywhere it is equal, so this option will be wrong. But if we also include points a and b, then it's kind of hard to say because then this option actually is correct because what actually happens is let's say th uh, this is the inner surface of the shell and this is the outer surface. So the electric field just outside the inner surface is kq by a squared and the electric field just inside is actually zero. But going from uh, inside to outside the electric field doesn't jump to zero. I'll explain it with the help of a graph. So okay so let's say this is x equals a. So just to the left of this guy the electric field is kq by a squared. So now let's say we take a point x equals a, a plus dx. So this distance is very small and is equal to dx. So the electric field will drop to zero something like this. So the point I'm trying to make is it, it just doesn't quickly jump to the value of zero is what I'm trying to say. It actually becomes zero over a small, over some distance. So basically just outside of x equals to a, it is kq by a square. And once it enters, it decays to zero through a finite distance of dx. So it just doesn't become zero instantaneously. So at x equals to a, the field is actually undefined. Uh, saying the field is undefined will be more correct. Um, but most probably they wanted you to judge the answer based on this region. And here, uh, obviously the electric field is equal. So option C will be wrong. So now in option D, um, they're saying if the point charge were to be moved to x equals 2a by 3, which is this point over here, then what, then what is the electric field for R greater than a? Uh, R greater than A, which is actually the inner shell, right? So now we have actually placed the charge over here. In, in electrostatic situation, even in this case, the electric field everywhere inside the conductor has to be zero. The, but they're saying for R greater than A, which actually includes the conductor as well, right? So and inside the conductor, we know the electric field will be zero. So option D is actually wrong. So the electric field lines would actually look something like this. Okay, and outside it will be uniform. Uh, if this was r greater than b, then it would be uh, kq by r squared. But from a to b, it will still be zero. So the only correct option will be option a. So, so now let's move on to the next question. Okay guys, so question number four, we already discussed in the last video. So I'm going to skip this question. Okay, so this is question number five. And in this question, we have a uniform solid sphere whose mass is m and radius is r. And it is placed at rest on a horizontal surface with coefficient of friction mu. The ball was given a horizontal impulse, j naught of fixed magnitude at a distance of alpha r from its center. Alpha is obviously less than one, meaning the point is somewhere in between these two points. Then which of the following statements are true? We have to talk about the final velocity. So first, so let's mark down the forces first. So there will be mg, uh, there will be normal, then there will also be friction, right? So now the thing is, the normal and friction will not be impulsive because the impulse is acting in the horizontal direction, right? So if it was, if it was applied at some particular angle, then the normal will also would have been impulsive. 
So the first point is that normal and friction are not impulsive. So now let's apply impulse momentum theorem in the horizontal direction. So the net impulse in the horizontal direction is J naught minus uh, integral of F dt. So integral of F dt is the impulse due to friction force, right? And this is equal to the change in linear momentum. So initially the ball was at rest. Finally, let's say it starts moving with a velocity of V and it starts to rotate with an angular velocity of omega about the axis passing through its center of mass. Okay, so the change in linear momentum will become m into v. So now option a and b, we can directly write it here. Final velocity does not depend on alpha. So this would obviously be correct because uh, alpha is just, just a term signifying where exactly is j naught applied. So it doesn't really matter where it is exactly applied. Uh, the only thing it depends on is how much is the impulse applied, right? So it clearly does not depend on alpha. So option a is correct. Okay, now in option B, they're saying it does not depend on mu. Uh, this is going to be a bit ambiguous because now the friction force is going to be kinetic in nature, right? Because the bottommost point is going to start slipping. So I can write it as mu times integral of uh, n dt, and this would be equal to mb. Now, uh, now n is also just equal to mg because in the vertical direction, forces are balanced. So, so mathematically speaking, um, we have mu appearing in this relation right? Even though this whole term is extremely small and we, ne we usually neglect it when we compare it to J naught, saying that it does not depend on mu would be wrong in my opinion. So I don't know about this option. Uh, it could be corrected. Mathematically speaking, it's correct, right? But usually we neglect that term. So it doesn't really depend on mu. So now in option C, they're saying the spear begins to roll without slipping. Okay, now obviously we don't have any information about the duration of the collision. So we'll just neglect this term, just like how we solve normally. So from here, the final speed just comes out to be J naught divided by M, uh, which basically means option D is wrong. If you look at option D, they're saying final velocity is some 10 J naught by 7 M, which is not true. Final velocity just depends on the impulse and the mass. Now, uh, now let's talk about option C. So when it is starting to pure roll. And uh, for that, we have to do angular momentum conservation. So let's choose this point over here. Okay, so let's call the point O. So I mean, angular, not angular momentum conservation, but uh, the net angular impulse, which is going to be the impulse J naught times perpendicular distance, which is alpha R plus R, right? So the angular impulse is going to be J naught alpha plus one times R. And this would be equal to the change in angular momentum. Okay, so the change in angular momentum will be MVR plus I omega. So it will be M v r plus i c m omega and as this is a uniform solid sphere this will be 2 by 5 m r squared times omega okay so now we have to talk about the rolling condition so so for the rolling condition v has to be equal to r omega right so after we cancel out one r this is what we end up with so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to erase r omega and put it equal to v j naught i can also write it as mv right from this equation over here so now as you can see mv cancels out from everywhere and we get alpha as 2 by 5 uh, which means option c is actually correct so the answer to this question uh, could be ac or abc i guess okay okay guys so that was it for this video so the rest of the problems we'll solve it in the next video if you enjoy the video please do like share and subscribe and that's it thanks for watching